So I'm going to be presenting sort of an overview of the space, what e-singles are, who's publishing them, why I think they're a really interesting format, and how publishers who are not uh, publishing them already can get into it, as well as some things that they might want to avoid. Um, so let's get started. Um, what are e-singles? E-singles are, as I you know, adorably said here, they're snack-sized e-books. Um, you will sometimes hear them referred to as digital shorts or just as ebooks, but um, I think the essential way to describe them is that they are longer than a blog post, longer than a magazine article, shorter than a full length book, so usually about 5,000 to 30,000 words, and they're generally sold at low prices, um, always below $5 and usually under $3. So, why do I think that e singles are you know, a really timely topic. Um, I don't know how, how well you guys can see this picture, but it shows a guy lying on his couch uh, under a blanket holding an iPad. And um, I'm, I'm sure we've all done something like this, if not with our own iPad, then with our e-reader. The point is that people like uh, what we sometimes call curling up with their gadgets. Um, this is people who want to sort of just get away from the sort of constant clicking around that you do on your computer at work and spend a little more time with some content. Maybe not and not so much time that they're reading a full-length book, but you know, spending a little more time. And a lot of companies right now are targeting people who like to do this. Um, so we're seeing a lot more sites like Long Reads and Long Form, which is shown here. I recommend checking those sites out if you haven't seen them yet. They curate longer articles from around the web from various sources, you know, magazines, newspapers, um, and what, this, what the content has in common is that it is longer. It's not a quick blog post. You can't read it in just, you know, a couple minutes and glance over it. It's something that you might want to spend a little more time with, and instead of people maybe reading it at their desk at work, they're going to load it onto their e-reader um, or their iPad, and they're going to read it on their commute home, or they're going to read it, you know, when they're relaxing. Um, so a couple of sites like this to check out, uh, long form, as I mentioned here, uh, long reads, which is a competitor. Long reads actually lists with each article. It pulls um, the number of minutes it takes to read it. Um, and then sites like Read It Later and Instapaper, what they do is they help people collect these articles into one place and save them to read later. So as you can see from the slide, more people are doing this. Um, the number of saves at Read It Later, they say it's gone up 37% over the past, sorry, over a six month period. And so people are going online, they're finding something substantial they wanna read, they're saving it and they're coming back to it. Um, what does that have to do with e-singles? To me, basically, it's just a sign that readers like this middle ground. Um, these works that are a few thousand words long are really ideal for the curling up thing that people are doing at home. Um, just, it's a time when you want to, when you want to read something a little bit more substantial. You don't want to just stand there like tapping around on your phone, getting that sort of weird feeling you feel when you've just read too many blog posts and you're sitting at your desk. It's taking some time to engage with content as you would with a traditional print book. It just doesn't take so long. So to me, it's a really engaging format. Um, so who's releasing these? Um, first of all, lots of different book publishers. Um, let's see. First, we'll start with traditional book publishers. Um, so you see two kinds here um, from Simon & Schuster. There's Mile 81 by Stephen King on the left. Um, he released that as a short story as a way to promote 112263, which is uh, his, his recent best-selling full-length book. The content of uh, My Lady One and the actual, the book that followed it wasn't similar. The works weren't related. Um, My Lady One was sort of a little appetizer and Simon and Schuster included a, an excerpt from 112263 in it. So it's just a way to keep readers engaged uh, between books. And then on the right, a little bit of a different approach, there is, um, a Runner's World Essential Guide published by Rodale, and that pulls together a bunch of different content from Runner's World magazine and packages it in one place. So these are not limited to fiction publishers. 
Uh, next up, magazines and newspapers. Um, many of them are taking content that they previously ran uh, in, in the print edition and stringing it together, enhancing it in some way, and selling it. Uh, Los Angeles Times, The Guardian, The National Post, The Washington Post, and The Boston Globe are some of the papers that are doing this. I think you'll see a lot more doing it. And magazines like Cosmo, GQ, Time, and Fortune. Just to give you an example, uh, this is A Nightmare Made Real. The LA Times released it last fall. It was their first e-single uh, by an LA Times staff writer who had you know, done some reporting on a Las Vegas banker accused of kidnapping and uh, torturing his child's mother. Um, and this includes new material, including more detailed portraits of the investigating detective and the defense team and a deeper look at the alleged suicide note that emerged at a pivotal moment in the case. And um, the author also provides an account of how the story started with a tip and grew into a narrative. So taking content that was originally published in the Los Angeles Times, enhancing it, and talking a little bit about the process of reporting it, that makes it into an e-single, and it's uh, 99 cents. They followed this up with a completely different type of e-single, which is a cookie cookbook for Christmas, um, and they plan to do about 10 of them this coming year. Uh, here is three e-books from the National Post. Um, they are partnering with HarperCollins Canada to release these, and I think each of them costs $2.99. Um, the National Post recently talked to Neiman Journalism Lab about this initiative. And what they said is that they're trying it all really quickly to see what works the best. Uh, Long-form reporting, columnist best ofs, investment advice, and movie reviews. So far, they said that the long-form reporting is working best, and the sort of columnist anthologies are not selling as well. Um, next, startups. There are a few startups that are focusing exclusively or almost exclusively on this space. Um, one of them is Byliner. That was launched in May 2011. It has an archive of journalism online, sort of a, a long reads-like collection of nonfiction and fiction authors' stories from around the web. Then it also releases these Byliner originals, uh, 19 of them so far. These are original e-singles, and um, Byliner pays the authors a fee, and then they share the they share the sales 50-50. Um, and some authors that they've done this with are Margaret Atwood, as you see here, um, John Krakauer, Ann Patchett, Amy Tan, and as I said, uh, 19 of them so far, I believe. Um, here is The Atavist. It's a startup that was launched by two former editors of Wired magazine. And The Atavist's uh, Stephanie Simon is actually going to be speaking after me about uh, some more of what The Atavist is doing. They've released, I think, 13 e-singles so far, and they focus on narrative nonfiction. Uh, and then here's one other newer startup, Now and Then, which launched this past December, and it focuses on serious nonfiction with uh, historical underpinnings. Then, um, obviously, you have to mention Amazon here. Um, Amazon's Kin Kindle Singles, I think, is really what kicked off this format. Um, they call it uh, compelling ideas expressed at their natural length. And I think that that's a good way to define e-singles in general. Um, Amazon is signing original authors for these. Uh, there's uh, one by Jeff Jarvis, one by Tom Rackman, the author of The Imperfectionists. Um, so signing original authors, um, also selling e-singles from the, some of the startups that I mentioned, like Byliner, The Atavist, and Now and Then. Um, there's a submissions process, and so far there's 164 Kindle singles, and they're signing up about three new ones a week. So I'll, I'll talk about more that more in a sec. Um, so, you know, I think you've seen from the previous slides that they really can be about anything. Um, mostly I see them falling into these four categories. So. For now, uh, fiction, which is short stories generally, nonfiction, you know, long-form journalism, the type of thing that might appear in a general interest magazine like The New Yorker or as a longer series in a newspaper, 
um, more personal nonfiction, like memoir and personal essays. Um, and then something we're seeing a little bit of and probably we'll see more of is nonfiction that's sort of how-to, cooking, useful, practical, stuff like that. Um, so where does the content come from? Uh, well, we saw that if you're talking about a book publisher or a startup like Byliner or The Atavist or Kindle Singles, those are focused on original content that was not previously published somewhere else. And so far what we're seeing from magazines and newspapers is that they're more likely to bundle together content that they previously published and then maybe enhance it in some way and sell it. Um, where are these being sold? So uh, we're seeing them in separate sections of an ebook store, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. Um, floating around in a general ebook store, which is not such a great idea. I'll talk about that too. Um, a lot of the times they'll be marketed on the source website, Byliner or the Atavist, and that site will include links out to the various e-tailers where they can be bought. Um, and then we're starting to see a couple of examples of e-singles being sold through publisher apps. And I'll go back to that at the end of the presentation. But let's talk about the largest storefront so far, um, which as I said is Kindle Singles. Uh, 164 titles, three new ones a week. There's a submissions process. You can't just say, oh, I have this Kindle single. I'm going to upload it into this section of the store. Um, you are vetted, and once they're accepted, um, you work with an editor, and they do editing, cover design, um, jacket copy, things like that. Uh, it then goes into the Kindle singles section of the site, and um, I had one publisher tell me recently that he thinks it is the single best ebook promotion tool out there because Amazon is really considering this a key initiative and they are focusing on this a lot. Kindle singles get a lot of attention on Amazon's website. They have their special section. They're featured pretty prominently in the Kindle store. And then they're worked into sort of um, separate promotions like Kindle daily deals or Amazon's uh, marketing emails. Um, you know, whatever you think about Amazon in general, they are doing a good job with Kindle Singles. There are just a couple. Um, Apple is doing this too, kind of. Uh, quick reads in the iTunes store. They're not signing up any original authors the way Amazon is, but they do have the separate section of iTunes. Um, all the books are under $5. And I'm hearing a lot of publishers say that they're selling an increasing number of e-singles through Apple. So it's not just Amazon bringing them these sales anymore. And here's a poor old Barnes & Noble. Um, you know, this, uh, there it is. It's not as developed as Kindle singles. It's called Nook Snaps. It's a pretty uh, difficult section of their website to find. It's kind of buried in there. I think it's somewhere along the bottom over here. Um, but it is there. So, you know, know about it. Um, and then here is an app. It's the Atavist's um, iPhone app. And as you see, you can buy singles directly through the app. So what do these cost? Um, as I said, mostly you'll find them under $3. A lot are priced at $1.99. Um, here's just where I broke down the 164 Kindle singles by price. You see that the majority of them are $1.99, about a quarter are 99 cents, and there's around 16% at $2.99. So $2.99 is probably on the more expensive side for these. If you're going to go higher than that, you, you probably want to think about why and look at your competition and see what they're pricing it at. Um, business models, how are these monetized? So we're seeing kind of four models, uh, three models. There's a standalone business or a startup um, using these as an additional revenue stream in a larger company and forming partnerships. So standalone business, startup, um, byliner, atavist, now and then reader. An additional revenue stream in a larger company, that's what we're seeing at most magazines and newspapers and at book publishers, and it's also how the Kindle Singles model works. These are a smaller part of a larger company. They're contributing to digital revenue, but they're not, you know, the whole thing. And partnerships. Um, 
lots of publishers in the United States are partnering with other publications to release these. Um, Hachette, Bloomberg Business Week, um, as I said, HarperCollins Canada, and the National Post. Random House, uh, separate divisions of Random House have recently teamed up with two different political websites to do 2012 campaign coverage. Uh, Penguin in the UK, it just teamed up with The Economist, and Open Road is working with uh, ProPublica, which is sort of a, a uh, nonprofit watchdog journalism reporting site. This can be a good way to, um, to sort of share the risk, not that there is that much risk involved with these, but um, you know, a lot of the times the partner can provide the content and the writers, and then the publisher can market them, or they can do that together and you have a built-in audience. You kind of, if you're releasing a Politico, a, an any single with Politico, you know, presumably Politico readers will be interested in that. So it can increase the prominence and the discoverability for both parties. Um, why are Apple and Barnes and Noble different? Uh, just because they're not signing up any original authors yet. Yet, anyway, they are just storefronts. So, what are the advantages of these? And I think that there are a lot. I think this is a really cool format. Um, well, for one thing, they maintain reader interest between book releases. This is gonna depend on the genre that you're publishing in, but for fiction, it's a good way to, to sort of keep readers interested and excited and engaged with an author between books and to get them excited for the next one. So, for example, um, Lee Child released one called Second Son. That's a standalone prequel to his Reacher novels, and it also included an excerpt of the upcoming book, and we saw Stephen King do that as well. Uh, the content was different, but again, there was also an excerpt of the upcoming book. Um, and publishers are telling me that these also do drive pre-orders for upcoming releases. Um, topic, I think, is really important, especially in fiction. Um, this is what Penguin's associate marketing director says. Length is not a driving factor for people who are buying these. I know that sort of goes against some of what I said before, but in fiction, this really does matter. I think readers know these, they have to know these aren't full-length books. Um, it's important for, for the publisher to make that clear. But they're not necessarily saying, oh, like, I really want to read something short. Um, you know, they, if this is by an author that they really love, they'll, they'll definitely read it. Um, so topic, topic is important, and marketing to topic is important. Um, sampling, doing the upsell. Uh, Hearst has released a bunch of Good Housekeeping mini cookbooks. And their editor called them an on-ramp to graduating people to higher priced content, whether that's print or digital. The hope is that if you buy a 99 cent mini cookbook, um, you may then decide, oh, you know, I like good housekeeping. I guess I'll buy this $35 good housekeeping cookbook too. Or I might buy one of the slightly lower priced good housekeeping cookbooks, like one for $9.99. But again, it's just, you know, it's a way to give people a taste, and if they like the brand, you know, they can sample it at low risk and then come back and buy more. Um, so repackaging content to create new revenue streams, it doesn't cost very much. Um, you know, if you already have this content in digital format, it's not a lot more money to compile it into a separate ebook. And, you know, in some cases, this content might have been given away for free before. Say, you know, an author wrote a short story, a publisher wasn't going to say, oh, you know, I'll print this up and sell it for two bucks in a bookstore. Um, maybe before that would have been a marketing tool or a promotion or something given away free to some readers, and now you can sell it. Um, a lot of authors of these are saying to me that this is just a way for them to sell content that they could not sell before, usually because magazines no longer take, you know, these long-form journalism pieces. It would be very rare for someone like, say, The New Yorker to sign up, a, to, you know, to agree to run a 10,000-word article. And um, a publisher might say, you know, can you puff this up? Like, can you enhance it? Can you make it longer? Can you make it into a full-length book? Um, so if you're caught, but if you have an idea and you're caught between those two formats, there wasn't really anything authors could do with that before. 
And on an e-reader, though, it doesn't really matter how long it is. Um, if the story is told well, just tell it, tell it at you know the length it needs to be told and get it out there. Um, and this is really a digital format. I don't think we're going to be seeing a lot of e-singles in stores. I don't in print e-singles in stores. Print singles in stores. I don't think that. Um, I don't think that that's necessarily the way readers want to read these. I think this is a format that's really made for digital. So what are the risks? Well, this isn't just a dumping ground for stuff you can't sell somewhere else. And it's really tempting, I think, to just be like, OK, well, I'm going to throw this at the wall, and we'll see what sticks. It doesn't cost us very much, so who cares? Um, but here uh, we have Random House executive editor John Meacham, who's working on the Politico eBooks, and he uh, is talking about, you know, don't do that. It's not just a way of getting anything out there. It does. Pro you do need to do some some sort of care on, you know, before you start selling it, um, even though it's not a very high risk endeavor. Fill a genuine gap in the market. That's Penguin again. Um, you know, if if you don't think there, if you can't see why somebody would read this, that's kind of obvious, but it probably won't sell. Um, and then discoverability is still a challenge. Um, here's uh, a journalist who wrote The Instigators for The Atavist. It was about 10,500 words long. And uh, he's saying here that uh, people who want to read it, even if they can find it, they still sometimes need guidance on how to get it. All of the outreach that publishers have to do, for example, to say, if you don't own a Kindle, you can still read an ebook on a Kindle app on your phone, and so on. You know, you have to do that with these, again, because people who are not, in, like, accustomed to digital reading are not not going to know how to read these or how to get this content. So, you know, tell them, tell them how they can get it. Tell them, on, tell them all the different apps and stores it's available on. Um, Low cost, again, you have to sell a lot of them. I mean, 100,000 sold sounds good, but if they're only 99 cents, it's not necessarily a lot of money. Um, there's also some, maybe some possible consumer confusion about what these are if you don't make that clear. If you go through, you know, any ebook store, you'll see that there's tons of full length ebooks that are priced at 99 cents. And sometimes when I'm looking at some of the Amazon <coughs> reviews on these, you'll see cost customer comments like, you know, this book is really short. This is such a ripoff. Um, <laughs> like, make it clear, and you won't have that problem. Put something, put a note on the cover. Um, include this in a special section of the store when you can. Um, you don't want customers to go on the site and, and just, you know, rank a book with one star because they were mad that it was too short. Um, so make it clear, make it clear what they are. Um, and finally, you know, these can be published really quickly. That's great. Um, but you still want to pick a topic that's relevant, especially if readers are already used to, to going online and getting the content for free. This is probably more of a consideration for uh, magazine and newspaper publishers who are publishing e-singles on current events. But, um, you know, think about I don't know, just to make sure that make sure that you're adding something new with your content and that you're continuing a story that people still care about. Um, so how are they doing? Um, I have a couple numbers I can share with you now. Um, I'm going to have more numbers uh, coming up in a piece that I'm working on now that's going to be available next week, so check paid content for that. But um, for now, I can say Byliner says it's sold over 100,000 copies of its e-singles. Uh, I believe the Atavist has said the same thing. Um, that's the only statistic that they've released, but um, it was, you know, released I think in December. So I'm sure the number's higher since then. Um, traditional publishers who are releasing these are doing really well. A, a lot of that has to do with the big name authors. Um, my Lady One by Stephen King, which was two ninety nine, has sold over three hundred thousand copies across platforms. And uh, Dean Koontz, Moonlight, My Moonlight Mind, and Second Son each sold uh, hundreds of thousands of copies, according to Random House. So, what's next? Um, 
Well, tablets make it easier for you to add um, other things to these, color, enhancements, video, music, stuff like that. Um, although, you know, watch out, readers haven't been that interested in paying more for enhanced ebooks up to now. I'm not sure that if a book is an e-single is 99 cents and you're like, here's this 4.99 version with a video, that, that will be enticing to them. Um, but there are certainly things that you can do with tablets and, and color screens, things like graphic novels, maybe some kids' books, things like that, that would make sense. Apps. As I mentioned, the Atavist has an app. Uh, I would expect Byliner would follow soon to do that. The Atavist can probably talk more about this. Are these, can these be bundled together and sold that way? Maybe. Um, anthologies don't sell very well. Short story collections you probably know don't sell well. Um, that said, people are interested in topic. So, yeah, I mean, if you have enough of these, you could probably sell them in a print book in a bookstore. Although, focusing on that too much, I think, kind of gets away from the true benefits of the format, which is it's digital and it's fast and it's a fast read. So I think the goal here is not to sort of fall back into thinking, oh, I have this, how can I stretch it into a full-length book, but to really think of it as a native digital format and, you know, enjoy that. Subscription models, this could make a lot of sense for some uh, publishers who are thinking about subscriptions now. And that's sort of generally fallen into uh, full-length ebook subscriptions, the way they're thinking about it. But this could be a, a low-risk way to test subscriptions as a publisher. You can let readers sign up and, and get one a month or something like that. It's a really good way to experiment with subscriptions. You can maybe layer what you learn from that onto making full-length ebooks available through subscription in the future. And I am sure we're going to start seeing experimentation with this coming from the startups, the Atavist and Byliner. I would not be surprised to see both of them start offering subscriptions soon. Uh, other retailers get involved. Um, Amazon has had a lot of success with Kindle singles. Again, um, part of that is because they're signing up original works. So will Barnes and Noble and Apple start signing original authors? Um, Will Kobo add a section to its site that is similar to what Barnes & Noble and Apple have added if, if they haven't done that already this afternoon? Oh, nice. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I think they will. And um, those companies so far don't seem as interested in original publishing as Amazon does, um, as in they're not, they're not doing original publishing. But what we want to see as this format grows is standalone sections of ebook stores that make it very clear what is in them, why, why it costs 99 cents, that's because it's short, and um, you know, what the benefits of these are. Finally, new genres. If you're watching this presentation and you're, you're not sure if you fit into any of the categories that I already mentioned, don't assume that there's nothing here for you. You know, take a look at your content and think about what might work outside the box, because I think a lot of things could. Um, Kids' books, you know, picture books, I guess, are generally already e-singles because they're short. But um, short stories for kids seems like a really cool area to me, and it's just something we haven't seen much of yet. This past Christmas, uh, Scholastic did a 39 Clues spinoff where they released one chapter of, uh, I think it was a 39 Clues book each day of Christmas break and kids could download the chapter each day. And that makes a lot of sense. It was 99 cents a, at each time, I think. Um, graphic novels, as I said, could be cool with this because more people own color devices. And then how to, we've seen a little bit of cooking so far. Um, and I know that nonfiction publishers have struggled with digitizing their content that people can already get online for free um, through sites like ehow.com and places like that. But I do think that if you have a good how-to topic that can be bundled into an e-single on something specific, maybe with charts or video um, explaining, you know, how to do something around your house, for example, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, and that is it. Great. Thanks, guys.